Hey everyone, in this video we're going to learn how to solve restricted domain word problems. Recently we've talked a lot about domains, restricted domains, and piecewise defined functions, and we're going to see how these concepts can be applied to word problems and real world situations. Our first example, Mark is shopping at the grocery store for oranges. The cost of x oranges is represented by the function c of x equals 1.25x. What is the value of c of 4? What does this value mean in the context of the problem? Starting with evaluating c of 4, so c of 4 is 1.25 times 4, so c of 4 equals 5. So what does this value mean in the context of the problem? It means that the cost of 4 oranges is $5. Perfect. In this situation, would evaluating c of negative 1 make sense? Explain. So the answer to this question is no, and our explanation has to do with the fact that he's buying oranges. Right? He's at the store and he's buying oranges. He's not going to go to the store and give them an orange. Okay, so our explanation is Mark cannot buy a negative number of oranges. Okay. In this situation, would evaluating C of 4.8 make sense? Explain. So the answer again is no. And our reasoning for this example, well, 4.8 means that he's buying four whole oranges and 0.8 of another which that doesn't make sense. He's either gonna buy a whole orange or he's not going to buy it. So no, Mark cannot buy part of an orange. Okay, so then the next question is, for what values of x does this function make sense? Right, what, what is a good domain for this function? Well, Buying zero oranges makes sense, right? He chooses not to buy any, or he buys one, he buys two, he buys three, he buys four, and we can continue infinitely on. Well, what set of numbers is that? Zero, one, two, three, four, continuing on? That's the set of whole numbers. So for what values of x, the whole numbers make the most sense as the domain of the function c of x, right? We don't want negative numbers, we don't want parts, right? We don't want 0.8. Hey, we just want whole numbers. He's either going to buy an orange or he's not. Okay, so now we get into the idea of what is the best domain for a given word problem. Looking at a few more situations, determine which of the given number sets would be the most appropriate domain of the defined function. So there might be two that work. We have to decide which would be the best or the most appropriate. A function that predicts the estimated wait time for a roller coaster based on the number of people in line. Okay, so the number of people in line is the domain. Okay, that's our input. So what number set best describes that? Okay, so we have real numbers. Well, one, two, three, those are all real numbers, but so is 0.1 repeating. And 0.1 repeating, we can't have that many people in a line. Okay, so not great. Let's work our way back if we need to. Integers. Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, those are integers. But so are negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. Again, that works, but let's see if we can do better. Whole numbers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That, that's pretty good, right? That would be how we describe the number of people in line. But we have one more to talk about, rational numbers. So... 0, 1, 2, 3, those are all rational numbers, but so is 1 half and 2 thirds. We wouldn't describe the number of people that way, right? We don't say there's half a person in line, right? Remember, rational number is a number that is can be expressed as the ratio of two integers. Okay, so out of the four number sets, the whole numbers is definitely our best choice. Next, a function h of t that models the height of a ball thrown straight up in the air after t seconds. Okay, so we throw the ball up, 
and then it comes back down and it's going to stay in the air from when we throw it up till it comes down. Okay, so we want a number set that describes all of the numbers from when it goes up to when it goes down. So let's work our way from rational numbers backwards now. So rational numbers, that's pretty good, right? We'd have one half, we'd have two thirds, one. Okay, that seems pretty good. Whole numbers, zero, one, two, three. Well, the ball can be in the air for 2.5 seconds. So that's not a whole number. That's not good. Integers, same issue, right? The ball could be in the air for 2.5 seconds. That's not an integer. And the real numbers. Well, real numbers describes every number on the number line. So we're between the real numbers and the rational numbers. Well, we throw the ball up and it comes down. We want all of the numbers from when it goes up to when it goes down. So write t equals zero to let's say t equals 10. We want every single number. Well, we definitely can't describe every number from zero to 10 as a rational number, right? The square root of two falls in there. Pi falls in there. So the best way to describe all of the seconds that the ball is in the air is with the real numbers. A function t of x that predicts the amount of time it will take to finish reading a book based on the percentage of pages read x. Okay, so now our input is the percentage of the pages. Okay, and remember, percentage, that would be part over whole. Well, just looking at that and looking at our number sets, if I can write it as part over whole, that means I can write the percentage as a ratio, which means it's a rational number. So automatically, my eye jumps to either of these two choices. And if we're reading a book, well, we're not going to read negative percentage. So positive rational numbers is the most appropriate domain. And that was actually easy, pretty easy to come to if we understand how we create a percentage as part over whole. Okay, so these are just a few situations and what each situation or what an appropriate domain in each situation would be. The school math team is going to a math competition that charges $100 per school, then $5 per student that enters the competition. The bus they are taking to the competition can hold at most 44 students. Write a function to, to determine the cost of going to the competition if n students attend. Okay, so we'll call our function c of n. That's not a very good c. Okay, so we'll call our function c of n, and that's equal to. So it's $100 flat fee, okay, so that's like the y-intercept. And the rate is $5 per student, so that's our slope. So our function is going to be 5n plus 100. So then the follow-up question, is there a domain restriction? If so, what would the corresponding range be? So is there a domain restriction? Well, there is because the bus can hold at most 44 students. So that means our domain, our n value, should be greater than or equal to zero, but less than or equal to 44, right? Does it really make sense to take zero students? No, but that is a potential outcome, but it definitely doesn't make sense to take negative students, and we can't take more than the 44 students that the bus fits. So if so, what would the corresponding range be? So our range, so if we input zero, I'll do the work on the side. If we input zero, our output's 100. And if we input 44, which means taking as many students as we can, we'd have five times 44, which is going to be 220, plus 100, which is 320. So our range is going to be 100 is less than or equal to C of N, which is less than or equal to 300. And 20. Okay, so there's the domain that makes sense for this problem and the corresponding range. The graph represents Charlie's drive to work, where x represents the minute since he left his house, and y represents his distance from his home in miles. So they're going to ask us some questions based off of this graph. 
and it's a restricted domain because it only goes from 0 to 10. What is the average rate of change on the interval 0 to 3? Okay, so again, we can write this as an inequality if it makes more sense to us. So let's find the two points. So at 0, we have the point 0, 0. At 3, we have the point 3, I'm not sure. So then how are we going to find the average rate of change? Well, what we need to notice is that it's on a line. And the slope on between any two points on a line is always the same. So I'm going to use this point here, which is a better point. And reading off the graph, the slope, we went up 1 and to the right 2. So the slope is going to be 1 half. So the average rate of change is 1 half. And that's the slope between any two points on the line. What is the average rate of change on the interval 4 to 7? Okay, so at 4, we have the point 4, 2. At 7, we have the point 7, 1. So to find the average rate of change, we'll find the slope between those two points. So 1 minus 2 over 7 minus 4. So we have negative 1 over 3. So that's our average rate of change on that interval. And again, just to rewrite the interval notation as an inequality, if that helps, okay, this would be the inequality we get. Describe what you think is happening on the interval 4 to 5. Well, from 4 to 5, the miles don't change. Okay, well, when don't the miles change? When you're stopped on your drive to work. Okay, so describe what you think is happening on the interval. So it's most likely that he stopped at a red light. We can also say stopped at a stop sign, but not as likely that he'd stay there for a full minute. Okay, but that would be another option to say that he stopped at a stop sign. The local ski mountain is tracking the snowfall for the past six hours to update their website. For the first two hours, snow fell at a constant rate of two inches per hour. The snow then stopped for the next two hours before starting again at a constant rate of three inches per hour. Draw and label a graph that models the total amount of snow in inches that fell after t hours. So what we're going to do in this example is create a graph like the one that was given to us in the previous example. So first things first, draw and label our graph. So I'm going to change this to the t-axis, so that represents the hours, and the y-axis, that will be the inches of snow. So for the first two hours, so we'll go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So for the first two hours, snow fell at a constant rate of 2 inches per hour. So we'll scale this by 1s as well. Now we don't need to if we're going by ones, but it's nice to have the numbers labeled. Okay, so two inches per hour. So two inches, one hour. Two inches, one hour. Then the snow stopped for the next two hours. So if the snow stopped, that means the total amount of snow on the ground is going to stay the same. So stays at four, stays at four. Then it started snowing at a rate of three inches per hour. So three inches in one hour, three inches in one hour. So there we have our points, and we can connect our points to create our graph. So there's our first piece, our second piece, and our third piece. Okay, so now we have a graph to model the situation. So if the snow started at 6 a.m., so that would be t equals 0, how many inches of snow was there at 10 a.m.? So that would be t equals 4, right, 4 hours later. So when t equals 4, we go up to the graph, so that's the point 4, 4, so there's going to be 4 inches of snow. And that was just based off of our graph. Next, write the piecewise defined function that models the situation. So we've done that before. We've written a piecewise defined function based off of the graph. 
So this piecewise function, we'll call this f of t, it's going to have three pieces. So the first piece, the y-intercept is zero, the slope is two, so the equation would be y equals two t, not x, because our variable is t. So that's our first piece. Now what domain is that piece defined on? Well, it's defined from zero to two. Now that point, this point, is shared by two pieces. So we have a decision to make. Do we want to include it on the first piece or include it on the second piece? Can't be both, has to be one. So let's include it on the first piece. So our domain is going to be zero is less than or equal to t, which is less than or equal to two. Now the next piece, well, that's just y equals four. It's a horizontal line. So our next piece is four. Now we included two on the first piece. So two is not included on this piece. And we go till four. Now again, that point is on both pieces. So we have a choice. Include it on the second piece or the third piece. Has to be one, can't be both. So let's include it on the second piece, just so we've taken care of it. So less than or equal to four. Now the third piece is a little more challenging because we can't see the y-intercept. Wasn't as easy there. But remember, we know how to write the equation of a line in point-slope form. So let's pick this point right on the middle. Actually, let's pick the point right here. Technically, that point is on both lines. Right, and that point is four comma four. It's a nice point. So writing an equation in point slope form with four, four, I'll do that below. So we have y minus four equals the slope of that piece. We went up three over one. We didn't scale our axes, so that's three over one. So a slope of three times x minus four. Now I need to get y equals just like the other pieces. So y equals three times x minus four plus four. We could simplify it, but we don't need to. We can just write three times t minus four. I'll change the variable when I'm putting it in the equation. Could have used t here as well. And what domain is that graphed on? Well, we included four in the second piece, so we don't include it in the third piece. And that piece is defined all the way till six. So less than or equal to six. And there we have the piecewise function that represents the graph that we drew. Okay, this is definitely a little more challenging, but now we can find how much snow is on the ground for 1.2 hours or 5.3, because we can plug it into our function, where it would be a little bit more challenging for us to do that off of the graph. Lindsay makes $12 an hour working at the local bookstore. If she works more than 40 hours in a week, she gets paid 1.5 times her hourly pay. Write a piecewise defined function that gives her hourly pay P in terms of hours worked H. Okay, so we have a piecewise function P of H, and it's going to have two pieces. When she works below 40 hours or over 40 hours. Okay, those are our two pieces. So our first piece, she's making $12 an hour, right? So the equation of that line would be y equals 12x. So we'd have 12h using the variables they've defined for us. And that's from zero is less than or equal to h, which is less than or equal to 40. Okay, so this is how we figure out how much she gets paid when she works no hours or she works all the way up to 40 hours right? Negative hours don't make sense here. So this is the best domain that we can write. Now we have to figure out how to figure out how much she would make when she works over 40 hours a week. Okay, so if we drew a graph just so we could visualize what this looks like, okay, there's that piece where she's getting paid $12 an hour. And then she gets paid one and a half times her hourly pay. So that means she gets paid $18 an hour. So the slope of that line is going to get even steeper. Let's draw a better diagram. Okay, so $12 an hour and then $18 an hour. Okay, so the slope was 12, then the slope was 18. Now for this piece, we don't have a y-intercept. So just like that previous example, let's use point-slope form. 
Let's figure out what this piece is here. That point is exactly when she works 40 hours, right? When she works exactly 40 hours, she gets paid one amount. So 40 hours at $12 an hour, that's going to be $480. Now that point is also on this line because it's a nice joined up graph. Okay, so let's use point slope form. So we have y minus 480 equals the new slope is 18 and then h minus 40. So y equals 18 times h minus 40 plus 480. So 18 times h minus 40 plus 480 and that's when h is greater than 40. Okay, so there's our piecewise defined function that we can use to figure out her weekly pay. To understand this second piece a little bit better, think of working if she worked 50 hours. She's gonna get paid $40, uh, 40 hours at $12 an hour and 10 hours at $18 an hour. Okay, so 480, that's her 40 hours at $12 an hour, plus this piece right here is what she makes in overtime, over that 40 hour mark, right? 50 minus 40, that gives us the 10 extra hours, $18 an hour, that's going to give us her pay when she works past that 40 hour mark. And we use point slope form of a line to make it simple for us. How much would Lindsay earn if she worked 43 hours? So P of 43 is equal to, so first thing we have to decide is what domain, so it goes in the second domain. So 18 times 43 minus 40 plus 480. So P of 43 equals 18 times three plus 480. So 30 and 24, so 54 plus 480. So she would earn $534 if she worked 43 hours. If she earned $240 in her last paycheck, how many hours did she work that week? So we have two pieces, so we have to decide which piece to set it equal to, because she can't make 240 in both of these pieces. Well, if we think about this, she makes $480 if she works exactly 40 hours. So 240 is less than that 480. So it's only going to make sense to set it equal to the first piece, which is 12H. We'll set that equal to 240. We would divide both sides by 12 and we get H equals 20. So she has to work 20 hours, which falls into the domain of that piece of the function. If we tried to set it equal to the second piece, we'd wind up with a negative, uh, not a negative value, we'd wind up with an H value that's less than 40. But that doesn't work because this piece of the function is only defined when H is greater than 40. One more example. A restaurant has a catering package that costs $400 for up to and including 30 people. Each additional person costs $15 up to a maximum of 60 people. Write a piecewise defined function that gives the cost C in terms of people P. Okay, so C of P, which is the cost per person. Now we're going to have two pieces. It costs $400 for up to and including 300 people. So that's just going to be 400 for zero is less than or equal to P, which is less than or equal to 30. And if we graphed it, it would look like a horizontal line. And once we hit that 30 mark, then we're charging 15 per person. So we're going to have a second piece, which has a slope of 15, and includes this point here, which is 30 people and $400. So we can use the fact that we have a point and a slope to figure out the equation for the second piece. We'll use point slope form. So we have y minus 400 
equals 15 times p minus 30, not x, but p using the variable here. So y is equal to 15 times p minus 30 plus 400. And we can keep it like this. So we have 15. Let's try that again. 15 times p minus 30 plus 400. And that's from 30 people, not including, to 60 people. So 30 is less than p, which is less than or equal to 60. So again, a graphing explanation, but giving a logical explanation here, it's $400 for 30 people. If we invite 31 people, we're only getting charged an additional 15 for one person. So p minus 30, think about this, 31 minus 30, that would give us one. That one person that they're charging us $15 for, plus the 400 we paid for the first 30 people. And we can continue that idea for 32, 33, 34 people. So how much would it cost to cater a party for 45 people? So C of 45, we have to decide which domain restriction 45 falls into. So it falls into the second. So that's 15 times 45 minus 30 plus 400. So C of 45 is equal to 15 times 15 plus 400. So 15 times 15 is 225 plus 400. So C of 45 is 625. So how much would it cost? $625. Okay, so the last two examples are a little bit more complex because that second piece of the function that we have to define but I would encourage you to use point slope form by thinking about that last point on the first piece, which becomes the first point on the second piece. And then figure out what the new slope of the line is going to be. You have a point, you have a slope. You can write the point slope equation, solve for y, and that's going to be the second piece of our equation. Right? If you find it helpful, graph it. Right, graph this like we did the snow question and see if it makes more sense and see if you can then get comfortable going straight to an algebraic solution. Okay, so a lot of nuances, a lot of different types of problems in this video. So make sure you practice a few of each. Click the Amazon link down below for my algebra workbook so you can practice on your own. Give the video a like and before you go, click that subscribe button so you can see more videos just like this. Thanks for watching.